All right, everyone. My name is Paula Borges. I think I know everyone here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about the evolution of vestibular schwannoma treatment. And let's see if I can get this to work. Whoops. I have no disclosures. Um, I chose this topic because I was doing a little bit of reading about stereotactic radiosurgery and I ran into this literature and it was very, very interesting so I went with it. Um, I was hoping none of the neurotologists would be here, but, but there are quite a few of you, hopefully you won't dispute my claims too much. Um, all right, so I want this to be interactive, and I'm going to start off by doing a mock oral board scenario, and it's meant to be really easy and straightforward, and just give me a couple of one-line answers. I just want to use this to sort of illustrate where we are in the treatment of acoustics today. So let's see. Um, Joanne, a 55-year-old guy walks into your clinic with left-sided uh, hearing loss for about two years. What do you want to do with him? Um. Um, okay, so um, the history is really just that he's had progressive hearing loss on the left side, also some tinnitus, not much else. The exam is pretty much normal other than a Weber lateralizing to the right. Um, you get an audiogram and this is what it shows here. Um, Jenny, can you describe to me what you see? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of small, but that's the main point I wanted to... It's an eye test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see. At this point, um, Liz, what would you like to do for the patient? Um, so I probably want to get some imaging. All right. So you get this imaging you and... Do an ABR? Anybody? Yeah. We'll keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see here? That's why the cost of medicine is so. <laughs> Duncan? Um, so this is a MRI T1 uh, with contrast, the, the level of the cerebral fronting angle that shows an enhancing mass uh, that looks to be within the IAC and uh, extending out into the cerebral frontine angle, um, maybe widening the, uh, the porous slightly. That's beautiful. All right, David, at this point, what's your basic differential and how would you counsel the patient? All right, so that's exactly what I wanted to illustrate, is that nowadays patients have options, and um, these are uh, entities that can be treated. Um, but that's not always been the case. So really the purpose of my talk tonight is to take everyone through how we came to uh, recognize acoustics as a clinical entity and how the treatment has evolved. So we'll start with some background, then we'll talk about the early history, followed by the modern era, and some potential future directions. Um, so, the uh, NIH consensus for the term is now vestibular schwannoma. However, Dr. Jackler, would you approve of this given the fact that there's an eponym involved? No. <laughs> All right, that's what I was looking for. So, so full disclosure, I was at that NIH, it was in the late 80s. I see. And, and I, you know, there are vestibules all over the body. So vestibular, it should be, if it's a vestibular, it should be a vestibular nerve schwannoma, right? Yes. No. But I do like schwannoma because neuroma is not correct, and it is yes. the name of the tumor that's widely known. But I, as you know, I prefer eighth nerve schwannoma. But I call it acoustic neuroma, even though it's not acoustic, 
And it's not in Europe. All right. Well, but my point is that um, Schwann cells confer the eponym named after Dr. Schwann, who was a physiologist in the 1800s. And really, Schwann cells are neurolimomas. So perhaps a better term would be vestibular neurolimoma. And this was a very accomplished gentleman who helped develop the cell theory um, and who also discovered pepsin, the organic nature of yeast, and he invented the term metabolism. Um, so a little more background. Again, these are benign Schwann cell tumors of the eighth cranial nerve. They're very slow growing generally. They're well circumscribed, and their mean growth is about 1.9 millimeters per year. Here's a left cr eighth cranial nerve tumor compressing the brain stem and the cerebellum. Um, they're usually derived from the vestibular division of the eighth nerve, and there's some controversy, but it seems like both the superior and inferior divisions are equally affected. To remind you a little bit of the anatomy of the eighth nerve, um, it arises from the caudal aspect of the pons, um, goes into the cerebellopontine angle, and then enters the IAC. Um, the facial nerve enters uh, anteriorly and it enters posteriorly and splits into the vestibular and cochlear branch. The cochlear branch um, uh, is in an anterior inferior position. The vestibular branch goes to the vestibular ganglion, then splits into the superior and inferior branch. And if you all recall, the superior um, branch uh, innervates the superior and lateral semicircular canal and utricle, whereas the inferior does the posterior semicircular canal and saccule. Um, and this is just uh, the brief schematic of the cross-section in the IAC and what we learn in medical school to sort of remember that the seventh nerve is up, cochlear nerve is down, and then of course you have Bill's bar and the transverse crest. <laughs> Um, in terms of the site of origin for the tumors, there's, there was initially some debate in the literature about where it arose, and it was thought to come from the glial Schwann junction, which is the boundary between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous systems. If you recall, um, the central nervous system axons are myelinated by oligodendrocytes, whereas in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cell does the myelination. And so at the junction between the two, um, in the eighth cranial nerve, is known as the Obersteiner red lip zone, um, and it was thought that the neuromas usually you, arise from this area, but it was later found that most of them come from the vestibular ganglion, because that's the area of the greatest density of Schwann cells. A brief reminder of the anatomy of the CPA. Um, it's in the posterior fossa. It's bounded laterally by the uh, petrous portion of the temporal bone. Um, it's a potential space here, and it's bounded medially by the pons and posteriorly by the cerebellum. And uh, we're talking about a Schwann cell tumor, so a little more about Schwann cells. They're trophic, they're cells that um, pr uh, help uh, support neurons. They promote saltatory conduction, and they're of neural crest origin. And they can myelate one axon at a time, and it usually takes several of them to myelinate one axon, whereas oligodendrocytes myelinate multiple axons. Here's a schematic of the Schwann cell. Here's a, ax, uh, a neuron cell body and its axon, and you can see a couple of uh, Schwann cells myelinating the axon. In between Schwann cells, you have the node of Ranvier, where you have high concentration of the sodium potassium ATPase to promote saltatory conduction. The myelin sheath helps by uh, uh, decreasing resistance and increasing capacitance, so you can have a higher, uh, faster action potential. Um, a little bit more background, uh, acoustics account for 6 to 8, uh, 10 percent of all intracranial tumors, and they're the most common CPA tumor. Um, can someone tell me what other tumors occur in the CPA? Anybody? Ryan? Well, I think David threw one out there. Yep, meningioma. So the most common is acoustic, but you also have meningiomas, cholesteatomas, some other schwannomas, and some rare tumors and vascular uh, masses. Um, there are about two to 3,000 cases annually in the US. More than 95% of them occur as non-hereditary unilateral lesions. The rest are associated with the neurofibromatoses. The median age of diagnosis is 50. Um, and just a brief word about NF2, it's autosomal dominant, as is NF1, but I won't discuss that too much because less than 5% of NF1 patients have acoustics. But as we all know, the hallmark of NF2 is bilateral acoustics. Less um, than 5%. If I can just help in that. Yeah, yeah. In please. my career, I've seen one. Okay. One. NF1 is very prevalent, far more prevalent than NF2. They don't seem to get it. So when we looked at the data of population, 
the probability was that I would have supported. It's right, just like I've right. seen a bunch of patients with acoustics and pituitaries, but it reflects the population at large. I don't think that NF1 patients get acoustics any different than, than the they don't population. get Schwann cell tumors. They get a very different kind of tumor. So I, it's less than 5%. That was absolutely accurate. But it's, a lot less. But, but it's a lot less. All so right. I, I have seen one, Rob. It was an NF1 patient, huge plexiform neurofibromas, and yeah. had tumors. And, and, and I've seen one as well. And it's weird. And then we sequenced the genome, yeah. and they had mutations in both the NF1 and the NF2 genes. Right. That's a different <laughs> story. Right. Yeah. With multiple, multiple intracranial tumors. Yeah. That's so called NF3, some have called Ooh. it, right? The high. <laughs> no, it's serious. That's the really? Ricardi. Yeah. Well, along with that, it, as we know, it's on chromosome 22, and most of the acoustics associated with NF2 are faster growing and occur at a much younger age. Um, about 96% of them are bilateral, and there are two types of NF2, and uh, the more severe type is the Wishart subtype. Um, risk factors for acoustics, the only really well-known one is NF2. There are others that are discussed in the literature, but it, it's rather controversial, it seemed to me. But um, things such as uh, loud noise exposure for many years, low dose rate, yeah. A lot of, yeah, there was contradictory information. That's why I say it with a caveat, and there are even some data about cell phone use and um, a lot of dental x-rays. But as I said, just NF2 really is the only known risk factor. Um, in terms of the pathophysiology, I'll talk more in detail about this later, but suffice it to say for now that it's due to biallelic inactivation of the NF2 gene, which is, a tumor, which is thought to be a tumor suppressor gene. Um, another uh, way in that the pathophysiology works is that these tumors express this molecule, um, neuroregulin, which uh, induces cell proliferation. And additionally, the tumor expresses the receptors for that molecule, thus causing an autocrine loop to support tumor growth. Um, in terms of symptoms, Dr. Jackler, I see you've dabbled in the subject, so I used one of your figures. Um, you have the antracanolicular stage, then the cisternal stage, the compressive stage, and hydrocephalic stage, which, which we see a lot less of um, this day and age. But basically, symptoms are associated with cranial nerve involvement or the compression of surrounding structures. Here are some signs and symptoms with um, their frequency of occurrence. Hearing loss in most patients. 26% um, of these patients get sudden sensory hear hearing loss. And some of them actually get better. Um, so that's something to be aware of if you're seeing a patient with sudden loss. But only about 1% to 2.5% of patients with sudden sensory neural hearing loss end up having acoustics. Um, tinnitus is pretty common as well as vertigo. When you start getting into the cisternal stage, you have worsening of the hearing loss, disequilibrium. And then in the compressive stage, you can start to have headaches um, and then symptoms due to cere cerebellar compression such as ataxia, wide base gait. Um, fifth nerve symptoms, and then once you enter into the hydrocephalic state and you have obstruction of the fourth ventricle, um, you can have headache, severe headache, vomiting, visual changes, altered mental status, eventually death. Um, you can also have some lower cranial neuropathies before that. And it's very rare to see facial nerve changes, although I think in one of Dr. Jackler's paper, it was like in the 20s to 30 percent, but in other um, Facial nerve? Yeah, the facial nerve dysfunction. But most of what I saw was very low. No, that's right. So um, trigeminal nerve dysfunction, right. larger tumors. Facial nerve dysfunction of any kind from the tumor itself is about 3%. And it's, it's hyperfunction, not hypo. It's some degree of twitch mm -hmm. or spasm. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, it's hard because there are a fair number of people that have blepharospasm normally in an asymmetrical way. But the number that actually have weakness before are most of the people with acute hemorrhage for giant tumors. So it's, it's uncommon. I'm not sure where that came from. OK. It didn't make sense, yeah. Um, in terms of diagnosis, I won't get into it much, but we saw the audio and sort of the main thing is imaging, specifically MRI. But previously, ABR was used and um, vestibular testing was used, but that doesn't seem to add much this day and age. Um, I'm not going to go into this chart at all. It's just a chart from Cummings showing some of the imaging features of the different CPA lesions. But I just want to point out that on uh, MRI, acoustics are generally ISO or hypo-intense on T1 and T2, and they enhance markedly um, post-GAD. So it's easier to distinguish from an um, epidermoid, but it may be a little bit harder in the case uh, to distinguish between a meningioma. So you really often have to look at the shape of the tumor. And the acoustics are generally going to be more spherical and have a more acute 
acute bone tumor angle, whereas the meningiomas are going to be more hemispherical, broad-based, and have a more obtuse tumor bone angle. Um, in terms of histology, this is something we should all memorize for boards. Um, it's basically characterized by lo these long spindle cells with cigar-like nuclei. And you have um, these zones of alternating dense and sparse cell cellularity, the Antony A or the dense regions, Antony B or the loose regions. Um, so now that we know a little bit of background information, I want to start to get into how we came to acquire this information. And the first um, uh, evidence of acoustic dates back to 2500 BC. Uh, there was an excavation site in Austria that yielded a couple of temporal bones of children that had widened IACs. And it's thought that these children had NF NF2. And here's a picture of IAC, a normal IAC and an enlarged IAC. Does anyone know what a normal IAC uh, diameter would be? No, anybody? Well, it's roughly, sorry. I, I shouldn't say six, but the kind of maximum of normal would be eight. This should be very important, say, because right. I can tell you, CT came in when I was a resident. And before that, and even early CTs, the word contrast, you didn't see soft tissue. So it was a matter of looking at the width of the IC, mm -hmm. and if there was an asymmetry in the IC bony diameter, that was one of the key things. And, and then many large tumors have no <laughs> dilatation of the meatus, right? Some small tumors right, do, right. but there are large tumors that don't that you would totally miss just looking at the osteology. And there were papers and a lot of analysis about the variation from one side to the other in nature. So that, you know, it, it's not very easy. Um, in 1997, we have the first post-mortem description of potentially an acoustic, but really just a CPA tumor um, by uh, Dr. Sandefort, but there was no cl clinical correlation associated with it, so there was not much known about that entity. In 1810, this gentleman, Levesque Lesource, correlated symptoms with the post-mortem findings, and that was the first time that happened. In 1830, um, there was a letter to Sir Charles Bell of uh, uh, Bell's palsy fame, describing a patient dying by an acoustic neuroma. And then in 1843, um, Toynbee, who sounds like he was one of the fathers of otology, um, who was someone that was heavily studying ear disease and had quite a collection of specimens, described the first IAC tumor. Um, in terms of diagnosis, the tuning form came about in 1825, introduced by Weber. Um, in 1914, Barney started some, uh, had published some early work in vestibular testing, but this wasn't really known by the early surgeons, so it wasn't helpful until later. And then up to 1930s, there wasn't really any reason for otologists to distinguish between um, conductive and sensory neural hearing loss, because there was not much one could do for hearing. And it was mainly, they were mainly trying to treat infection. Um, but in 38, Lemper introduced the one-stage fenestration, so it became worthwhile to distinguish between the two entities. And so that diagnostic field emerged as well. In terms of imaging, the x-ray didn't come out until 1895. In 1812, there was talk about, as Dr. Jackler mentioned, using x-rays to pick up IAC enlargement. And then in the 20s, there was talk of developing a temporal bone-specific x-ray. Um, in terms of surgical developments, uh, the first uh, procedure under anest ether anesthesia was in 1846. And then in the 1860s, uh, the aseptic technique really emerged from the work of Pasteur and Lister. In 1890, Halstead introduced a surgical glove. And then it wasn't until 1826 that cautery was introduced by Cushing. And this was also the time of uh, the infancy of blood replacement therapy. In uh, 1894, there's the first account of um, uh, operation on acoustic neuroma that was successful by Sir Charles Balance. I'm not going to read this to you, but suffice it to say, it was bloody. And the patient nearly died, but miraculously survived after much resuscitation effort, and went on to live for several years after that with cranial nerve uh, 5 and 7 deficits. Um, here's a picture of him. He was quite a pioneer. He pioneered the 7 to 11 anastomosis, radical mastoidectomy, and cranial nerve 8 sectioning for vertigo. 
Um, so he sort of set off the, uh, the, the, acoustic treat uh, the surgical treatment for acoustics. And then in 1903, Krauss was a neurosurgeon, described a unilateral suboccipital approach or the retrosig approach. But he reported an 85% mortality. Um, next, the following year, Pants was an otologist, described the first use of the translabyrinthine approach. But that was abandoned for quite some time because he also had a very high mortality rate. Um, in, and the following year, Borchardt um, introduced the transsigmoid approach, which obviously didn't pan out very well due to heavy hemorrhaging and death. Um, oh, that didn't show up, but this was a picture of one of Krauss's um, drawings of him finger dissecting yeah, an acoustic. So basically, it was hammer and gouge technique and then finger dissection, lots of bleeding, lots of bleeding usually death. That's how I pictured it anyways. Um, then came the era of Harvey Cushing. Um, he began to recognize this lesion on a clinical basis. And it's funny because there's talk in the literature about withholding the diagnosis from the patients because it conferred such a high mortality rate, both the surgery did. Um, and so they, people thought that it was better to just let the patient live in peace until they died from the, from the tumor rather than killing them during surgery. But anyhow, Cushing began to recognize these earlier. He felt that um, surgery conferred too high of a mortality rate, but he recognized that the patients were in extremis. So he introduced the uh, subtotal appro uh, removal approach, and he decreased mortality from 80% to about 20%. But at this time, he couldn't identify the site of the lesion, so he was doing uh, bilateral retro SIGs. And he that also. Did a great job, but that wasn't the reason. This is the reason acoustic tumors. Is it okay? I mean, I please, don't want to. You're, you're doing no, no, a great no, no, no. job, actually. I, I but want it to. wasn't because he couldn't localize it. In fact, okay. the reason acoustics were the first tumor operated on was because they could localize it. The, the only two things they could localize before imaging were things on the motor, motor strip that gave Jacksonian seizures or, or, or they gave uh, weakness to a particular area because they understood the uh, motor homunculus or in a place where there are area of cranial nerves. So they know if someone came in deaf with a numb face, they knew they had a syndrome of the cerebellum pontine So they would come in, typically with a brain tumor, with just the brain tumor syndrome, headache, failing vision, and unremitting headache, and sometimes seizures and herniation symptoms. So they did localize. Okay. The reason he did both is because we don't remove it all. He did a crossbow incision, took out both suboccipits, because he wanted to decompress the posterior closet because he left so much tumor in. And you'd see these folks with his buffalo hump off the back. That's why he opened both sides and he took all the bone off because okay. it reduced intracranial pressure. All right, good to know. Um, other things that Cushing uh, did to evolve the field and, and surgery in general was he began recording intraoperative vital signs so that he could understand when a patient was about to do poorly. Um, and he also introduced hemostasis um, by both uh, uh, cautery and surgical clips. And I wonder what Dr. Sirjani would have done without him. <laughs> Of course, he, of course, he developed it. You know the guy he developed it with? Who? A guy named Bovey. <laughs> he was a professor yes. of electrical Makes engineering sense. in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So Cushing's pupil, Walter Dandy, came along, and he began heavily advocating total resection. Um, and he apparently was an incredible surgeon with very meticulous technique, because even though he was doing total resection, he, he had a 10% mortality rate. And he was doing quite a few cases. And so his success is attributed not only to his technique. And see, this is where I had misinformed myself, because uh, my understanding was that he was able to identify the site of the tumor where previously others weren't, um, so this is wrong. But um, he was also operating on smaller tumors because um, they were diagnosing them earlier during his time. Um, after him, there, uh, there were some sort of slow advances, but overall the fields of surgery uh, much improved with the introduction of antibiotics, um, blood replacement becoming commonplace, audiology uh, started coming into play and becoming better and better as vestibular tests and of course radiology. Um, in 1941, Olive Krona described the importance of sparing the facial nerve during the surgery. And it's my impression that it's sort of during this time that this, the treatment of this disease became from merely saving the life of a patient who was an extremist to trying to actually spare neurologic function because we were diagnosing things earlier. 
And then in uh, 49 Atkinson and describe the um, distribution of the ICA and the importance of it, of uh, keeping it intact during surgery. There's a great backstory to that, by the way. And that was Atkinson, this was in London, and uh, Halpike and Cairns, the neurosurgeon, and Halpike was the vestibular physiologist, had many of his patients that were so terribly dizzy, they decided they wanted to divide the eighth nerve. But Cairns wasn't very good at it and would hit ICA, and a number of these people having eighth nerve sections died. So the pathologist looked in and found they died because of a lateral medullary infarct, and they put two and two together about ICA. Because, you know, the dictum early on was, if there are vessels in the way, just clip them. And that's what they would do. So it was operating on many years patients that that got figured out. And Oliva Corona had a nurse who, throughout the operation, was on her knees holding a flashlight to watch the patient's face. That's how they did nerve monitoring wow. in Stockholm. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have the residents on their knees now, but I know, you know we sure do watch the face sometimes for other procedures. It's funny how many side stories there are. It was very interesting reading about some of them. Anyways, um, sort of uh, my impression is that the modern era of sort of the paradigm used today um, evolved at the time of William House. Um, so uh, the operative microscope was introduced to otology in the 1930s by Holmgren. And of course, I'm butchering a lot of these names, and I apologize to those who know. But then um, in the 40s, the diamond burr and continuous irrigation was introduced. And so House used both of those techniques to operate on acoustics and really evolve the field. He teamed up with uh, John Doyle, a neurosurgeon, and they began using the middle of fossa approach, um, which House had developed for IAC decompression and eighth nerve sectioning. However, they began to realize that it was not adequate for larger tumors. And in choosing another approach, there was heavy dis disagreement between the two because House was advocating for, to try the trans lab once again, um, but Doyle felt the suboccipital <coughs> approach was better, so they split. So uh, Dr. House went to te uh, teamed up with Dr. Hitzelberger and they began sort of the two-team approach, although it was, House was usually doing the tumor dissection, which is a little different sometimes than what we do today, not necessarily. Um, he adopted the supine position previously. They operated with House and Hitzelberg. No, they, they shared it, and Hitz is a neurosurgeon. Right, so. right, yeah. Yeah, but the way I saw it described is that initially the, um, he was doing sort of the temporal bone uh, drilling and then House was doing a lot of the dissection, but the idea was that they both should be able to do both, that was, that and they good. were. Yeah. Yeah. But Hitsy yeah. was always involved in taking out the tumors. Bill would perhaps do the facial nerve dissection. That's true. But Hitsy, as a neurosurgeon, did learn how to drill the temporal bone, <laughs> and he was really bad at it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw him do it a few times. Um, fast, I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then they, uh, he started to use um, posterior fossa myelograms to localize and quantify the tumor size, which helped improve the imaging. And then, of course, in the 60s, um, steroids were introduced, which, which helped with brain edema. So we really entered the modern era. And here is an illustration of the approaches. Um, uh, here is your trans lab approach and the uh, retro sig and middle fossa. So Joanne, can you tell me sort of what are the pros and cons of the trans lab approach? Um, so the trans lab approach is most appropriate for a patient with no serviceable hearing because it um, takes out the That's good. It actually gives really wide exposure, so you can really do any size tumor with that. Um, and the the downside really is the loss of hearing. So if you try, if someone has serviceable hearing, you consider retro sig. Although it's harder for strictly intracanalicular. So if it's a smaller tumor, you go middle fossa, because as you can see, the the middle fossa approach is sort of limited to smaller tumors due to the view. Um, in any case, surgical complications include the following, CSF leak meningitis, but really we're down to a 0.2% mortality rate from 85%. So the field has come a 
very, very long way. Um, and in terms of outcomes, there are a lot of numbers in the literature, but roughly 96% of patients are able to get total resection without recurrence and long-term follow-up. And uh, patients with smallest tumors, over 90% have normal facial nerve outcomes. Larger tumors, it's a little trickier. But hearing preservation is possible in about 50% of patients or so that come with hearing. Um, so we talked about surgery, but what about radiation? So the history of radiation is also very interesting, but much more recent. Um, and the, the concept of stereotactic neurosurgery really emerged in 1908, um, where Horsley, who was a neurosurgeon in Clark, um, wanted to do the stereotactic uh, mapping of the brain monkey so that they could st study the brain. And that was applied to humans in 1947 um, by this neurotologist who began mapping uh, the, uh, the, the human brain, basically, in a stereotactic fashion. Then in the 1950s, multiple apparatuses were developed, and they were aimed at treating movement disorders. And it was quite a success because it took down mortality rate in that type of surgery from 15% to 2%. Then Lars Lexel, who is known as the uh, father of uh, stereotactic ra radio surgery, who is a trainee of Olive Crona, applied um, the stereotactic technique for radiation delivery in 1951. And that's sort of how um, uh, the treatment of gamma knife emerged. He initially envisioned it for functional neurosurgery. Um, and then these physicists came along and developed a cyclotron to deliver proton beams. And Lexel used the device to treat uh, on a human for the first time in 1960 to do a bilateral anterior capsulotomy, which is a treatment for OCD. Um, and then uh, in 1968, he developed the first gamma knife, which was in Sweden. Here's a picture of the second model, which he used to, um, which he intended for stereotactic radio surgery. And at the t initially, he used plain radiographs and air encephalography for the imaging. Um, and in 1976, perhaps while Dr. Jackler was in residency. The CT was then introduced, actually no, but the CT used in this application. And then in between 68 and 82, he treated over 700 patients with gamma knife and um, 94 of them had acoustics. And so um, by 85, they began using MRI. And in 87, the first gamma knife was uh, uh, developed at the university in the US, and it was in the University of Pittsburgh. And then the latest model of the gamma knife is this one, which is the perfection model. Do we have one? Is that? No. no. Cyber. Just cyber knife. OK. And so the way gamma knife worked briefly is the radiation store is cobalt 60, which decays to nickel 60 and emits two gamma rays in the process. And basically, you have multiple sources, up to about 200 of them, um, in this apparatus. Um, here is the patient's head in a rigid uh, frame. And so the sources of cobalt are here. And they're delivered um, to the target um, by the use of these tungsten collimators, which basically direct the radiation beam to the target. And um, basically, the concept is here in this very simplistic diagram. So if a normal radiation beam, if you're aiming for this target, is going to do a lot of surrounding damage, whereas if you have multiple sources with smaller collimators that can all be aimed at the target, you can get a higher dose of radiation to the target while sparing the surrounding tissue a little bit more. Um, and then the concept of how to map out the tumor that you're treating is by um, these, these uh, fields that you have multiple uh, uh, points that you are, and now I'm, the term is slipping my mind. Um, but basically, you, you, you have sub isocenters, thank you, sorry, brain. <laughs> Several isocenters to get to the shape that you want of the tumor. Um, and then, of course, there are the other uh, radiation sources involving linear accelerators. Um, these were introduced in 1983, and here's the variety of them. And sort of the mo most sophisticated is the cyber knife, which was introduced by Dr. Adler here at Stanford in 97. And basically, in this um, uh, example, the, the radiation source moves around the patient. And with the cyber knife, you don't need to f rigidly fix it. Uh, the head, so it's much more comfortable for the patients. And also, the uh, radiation can be, the um, angle of the beams can be modified in real time, so it can be very delivered very specifically. There's also a proton beam that I won't go into because um, although it's postulated to have, to be very good because there's minimal entry and exit radiation dose, it's very expensive and not really affordable. And so radiation is very efficacious. About 91% 
uh, success rate is reported, and the breakdown of that is about 32% of patients get tumor regression, um, and about 59 have stable tumors. And then those that progress can either get surgery or re-radiation in some cases, although that's controversial. Um, there are several complications as well, um, and also, uh, you know, the most common one is hearing loss. And uh, what we've done for that is try to reduce the radiation dose and add more isocenters to be more specific to the target. Um, so that's sort of the, moder the, the modern era, but what about the future era? And briefly, let's discuss Merlin. And not the wizard, but the molecule. And it's an acronym for this. And it's basically a cytoskeleton protein that's involved in cell-to-cell uh, -cell attachment, motility, and signal transduction. It was isolated in 1993 by two separate groups. Um, and basically, it's involved with several different pathways that um, uh, have to do with contact-mediated growth inhibition, and it's a, it acts as a tumor suppressor. Um, and there's so much molecular biology involved, and I'm not going to go into it, but this is a simple uh, diagram showing sort of how, basically how it works. So the active form is not phosphorylated, and it basically inhibits the RAC pathway, which is a mitogenic signaling pathway. And when Merlin is phosphorylated, then that pathway uh, is more active, leading to potential tumor formation. So um, in a patient with biallelic inactivation of Merlin, you can see how this pathway can sort of get out of hand and you can support tumor growth. That's a very simplistic overview. Um, these are some of the other molecules in um, signal transduction pathway with which uh, Merlin is involved, including CD44 and EGFR signaling, which has to do with DNA synthesis and cell proliferation, as well as the RAS, RAF, and WIN pathway. Um, and the E3 ubiquitin ligase pathway as well. So I think the future goal, which we're far from it now, is to sort of molecularly targeted therapy, which right now is only a few cases have been reported in NF2 patients, but the use of a VEGF inhibitor has been reported with some success in NF2 patients, but there's really only 12 cases reported in the literature. Surprisingly, some actually even had hearing improvement. I don't know if that really is related to the treatment, but um, other tar uh, molecular targets that um, have some promise are the following, and they have shown some decreased uh, uh, tumor proliferation both in vitro and in mouse studies. Um, and then, of course, PAC inhibitor, I showed you that PAC is one of the molecules that can phosphorylate Merlin. So by inhibiting that, perhaps that's another um, potential treatment. In conclusion, we've known about acoustics since the 1800s. Um, surgical uh, treatment began in the 1900s and evolved drastically in, into the modern era in the 1940s. Um, radiation became available in the 50s. The molecular basis of disease became known just recently in the 90s. And a few medical trials have begun in the 2000s. So um, <coughs> patients nowadays have gone from having this life-threatening tumor to something that's quite treatable nowadays. That's it. Very good. Paula? Yes. Uh, from a, a didactic standpoint, what's the cutoff age and the treatment and the size of the tumor nowadays? I know what it used to be, but what is the preferred treatment for age group and for size of tumor? So um, in terms of age group, uh, in an older population, I don't know that there's really a cutoff age, but the more elderly, and I, I think roughly we use something like 70 years old and up, you tend to lean towards radiation, but it also has to do with life expectancy. So if it's a sick patient that doesn't have a very long life ex expectancy or who's a poor surgical candidate, you would tend to recommend radiation in those cases. And also, radiation is really not good for tumors greater than depending on who you ask, three centimeters. So you're, if it's smaller than that, it's a good option. Um, otherwise, generally surgery if it's a, it's a surgical candidate. So it hasn't changed that much then? Huh? Well, that, that was a really good answer, actually, because it, it is a complex thing. It often involves patient choice, a lot of things. Yeah. You should realize that all three neurotologists and both of our fellows all do CyberNAF training, that we all do many, many treatments. We do ourselves, we do the treatment planning, to light it up. Every once in a while, I'll grab a resident and come down and see. But for some reason, you guys are usually busy in surgery and don't come down. But we do a lot of stereotactic radiation. You also should know that of every 100 newly referred acoustic roma patients, probably 60 of them just get follow-through, even sometimes in young people. 
depends on how long your history. I mean, there's a gazillion factors, right? Somebody's had hearing loss in 10 years, 10 years and has a little tumor. It may not be growing. Right. So there's a whole lot of people we follow. And it gets really complicated about what's right, but we're mostly operating on larger tumors and younger people. Right. Well done. Good job.